During the winter of 1931, on desolate moorland, the body of a female was found by two of her co-workers. Clinging to life, she whispered details of her ordeal and, chillingly, with her mother by her side, spoke with her final breath, I have been murdered. The 6th of January 1931 started as normal for 27-year-old Evelyn Foster, a taxi driver working at her father Joseph's firm in Otterburn, which is a Northumbrian village located approximately 16 miles from the Scottish border. Not much is known about her life up until 1931, however, Evelyn Foster was known to have been a strong and practical woman and was perfectly capable of taking care of herself. It was generally viewed that her job as a lonely female taxi driver made her quite vulnerable, however, she never experienced any problems. On the night of the 6th of January at approximately 7pm, after having dropped off three passengers in Rochester, Evelyn was driving along the road and was two miles away from Otterburn when suddenly she was halted by a man. The stranger was stood by another car which was fully occupied and he had told Evelyn that this driver was heading it towards Hexham, but he wished to travel to Newcastle. Questioning her, he asked if Evelyn could take him to Ponteland, which was around 20 miles up the road, where he had hoped to catch a bus to Newcastle. The unknown customer was apparently well-mannered, soft-spoken and immaculately dressed. So there was nothing to indicate that this man was a rogue or a threat of any kind. Evelyn drove back to the Foster's garage in Otterburn and stated to the man that the journey would cost him two pounds, which he acknowledged. Whilst refilling the fuel tank with petrol, the mysterious man stepped into the Percy Arms and ordered himself a beer. It didn't take long before Miss Foster entered the Percy Arms and collected the stranger, the pair swiftly departing from the village at approximately 7.30pm. What happened next is based entirely on eyewitness account of Evelyn Foster, which she spoke whilst she lay dying that night on the moor. Whilst driving through the darkness, Evelyn and her passenger spoke about various topics. However, the unidentified man never told her his name, just that he was apparently from the Midlands. Foster herself believed this man to possess a Tyneside accent, and he was noted as being extremely knowledgeable about automobiles. He was about 5 feet 6 inches tall and was between the ages of 25 and 26. He was clean shaven, wore a bowler's hat, a dark tweed suit and an overcoat. Six miles from their destination of Ponteland, the man demanded Evelyn to turn around her car and drive them back from where they came. Evelyn asked him why, but the stranger just snapped back at her saying, that's nothing to do with you. When Evelyn refused him, he attempted to grab the steering wheel, and obviously Evelyn was not about to let that happen. So Evelyn fought back, and unfortunately, the man punched Evelyn in the arm, which actually caused temporary blindness. The man then overpowered Evelyn and took control of the vehicle. The man turned the car to then drive back towards Otterburn, with Evelyn just pinned against the driver's side door. The vehicle then came to a stop outside a business, and this business was called Wolf's Nick, which was located on the outskirts of Otterburn Village. Oddly, in this moment, the man offered Evelyn a cigarette, of which she refused. Taunting her, he mockingly said, 
Well, you are an independent young woman. Evelyn Foster's memories of the events that followed is murky at the best of times. Allegedly, the young woman was then thrown into the back of the car where she was unfortunately beaten and sexually assaulted. The man then covered her in a rug and then took what Evelyn believed to be a small bottle out of one of his coat pockets before pouring a liquid out of that small bottle all over Evelyn and the rug. Evelyn was then set alight. While Evelyn was engulfed in flames, she was miraculously able to crawl away from the vehicle and onto the moors, making her way through all the shrubbery that was on the side of the road. She remembered hearing a car come to a stop and then a conversation between two or three men, but for some reason or another, this car and the men inside it drove away quickly from the scene. It was about 10 p.m. that night when two men who were actually co-workers of Foster, Tommy Rutherford and Cecil Johnson, drove by. Now, this pair actually noticed the smouldering vehicle and decided that they would stop and investigate. The pair were stunned when they realized that the vehicle that was smoldering and had been on fire was actually that of the company that they worked for. And they were even more shocked when they found Evelyn Foster, who at this point was slipping in and out of consciousness. Despite being very, very badly burned, Evelyn told the men that it was that awful man. Oh, that awful man. He has gone in a motor car. Rutherford and Johnson immediately transported Evelyn in their car to her family home and a doctor was promptly called. Sadly, there was nothing that the doctor could do to save the life of Evelyn Foster. Evelyn Foster sadly passed away in the early hours of the morning of the 7th of January 1931. Her last words etched into the memory of those who witnessed her final breath. I have been murdered. Police began an investigation and found a glove and a footprint by the car in the moor. If the suspect had run on foot or had taken public transport, it would be fairly easy to track him, but unfortunately nothing was found in their searches. Northumberland police were eager to speak to any witnesses, including passengers in the first car which Evelyn saw, for picking up the man. These people unfortunately never came forward, however the barman at the Percy Arms provided a statement which threw the investigation into chaos. Evelyn's father told the Chronicle it's terrible. It's terrible. I can't think why it happened. Her purse had not been taken away and I can think of no motive. In what was called the biggest manhunt in Northumberland, it became apparent that not one single person had seen an individual matching the description of Evelyn Foster's attacker on the night of the 6th of January or in the early hours the following day. The barman at the Percy Arms claimed that the stranger had never visited the pub for a drink. Evelyn also never made an appearance. Various detectives became somewhat suspicious of Evelyn's recollections of the night in question. Firstly, witnesses who claimed to have seen her stated that she was alone in the taxi. Despite claiming that she was set on fire and then escaped the car towards a ditch, no burn marks were found at the scene. Authorities believe that the vehicle was slowed before leaving the road and set on fire once it stopped. The inferno began at the rear of the vehicle, set most likely from a gas canister in the boot. Also, it seemed odd that once she pulled from the steering wheel and was pinned to the passenger seat, she didn't try to use the brakes, and police found that it would have been nearly impossible to drive towards Wolf's Neck without any erratic driving or driving which would have caught the attention of passers-by. 
The cloud of doubt was further darkened when the autopsy report was completed. Evelyn had claims that she had been a victim of a sexual attack. However, the autopsy found no evidence of such an attack. It was discovered that Evelyn was in actual fact still a virgin when she died. And there was no physical sign of injury or assault on her face or neck. It is theorized that Evelyn set her car alight in order to claim insurance money fraudulently. However, it is suggested that in the middle of committing this fraud, she accidentally set herself alight. During the inquest regarding Foster's case, the coroner agrees that this theory is most likely to have occurred and the jury strongly agreed. However, in a strange turnaround, since many of the jury members actually knew Evelyn and her family, the verdict in Evelyn's case was willful murder against some person unknown. The Foster family was understandably furious at the police's conclusion that Evelyn was somehow responsible for her own demise. The family knew her as a hard-working, respectful, and honest woman. If Evelyn's car had been teetotaled, then the total insurance payout would have been about £100. But Evelyn at the time had a very healthy bank balance and would have not needed that money in the slightest. The captain of the Otterburn Police Department came to the conclusion that the man on the night of Evelyn's attack never actually existed. Yet, this continues to be a cause for discussion in this case. Perhaps the reason for Evelyn and her customer not being seen by anyone that night was because they didn't actually enter the Percy Arms. It is entirely possible that this man had been waiting outside for Evelyn while she filled up her car with petrol. Evelyn never carried lighters or matches. She had no need to. So there was a lot of confusion about how the fire had been started if she alone was responsible. There was maybe no bruises found in the autopsy report because the man had only hit her just hard enough to temporarily stun her which may not have actually left any evidence of an assault. It was never properly confirmed that Evelyn had actually been a victim of sexual assault. And sexual assault in this case could have been brought into the case by a simple means of misunderstanding. In Evelyn's statement, she never actually mentions being sexually assaulted once. However, Evelyn's mother, Margaret, recalled that she had actually asked her daughter whether the man had, quote, interfered unquote, with her. To which, according to her mother, Evelyn replied with yes. And the police believed this to have been a confirmation from Evelyn of a sexual attack. Going against the authorities and the official statement and conclusion, the general opinion of crime historians believe that Evelyn had actually been murdered. If this had been the case, who was this mysterious man? What were his reasons for attacking Evelyn with such brutality? And where did he flee to following the incident? In 1977, a potential suspect was suggested by author Jonathan Goodman in his book, The Burning of Evelyn Foster. His name was Ernest Brown, who in 1933, two years after Evelyn's death, shot his employer at Point Blank Range near Tadcaster, Yorkshire, around 100 miles from Otterburn, and tried to burn the body to cover up any evidence. The 31-year-old's motive was that he was having an affair with the wife of his employer, Frederick Morton. Ernest worked as a farmhand at a farm just outside of Otterburn and was noted by Goodman that he looked strikingly similar to Evelyn's description of the man who had attacked her. Ernest was also from Tyneside, which matched to the accent Evelyn had pinpointed in her description, and Ernest dressed similarly to the unknown man. He had a friend who lived in the village of Otterburn, which could have potentially aided him in absconding. Whilst awaiting his execution by hanging, Ernest Brown was asked by a priest to confess to his sins. He mumbled under his breath a sentence which was either ought to burn or otter burn. Tony Stevens, Major Investigation Team Supervisor for the Northumbria Police Crime Department, said 
We never close our murder investigations until they are solved, and in some cases we can look to see if there are any new scientific or technological methods we can use to help identify DNA and follow leads which were previously impossible. No official conclusions have been made and the case is widely publicised as an unsolved murder. Almost a century later, the circumstances surrounding the horrific death of Evelyn Foster remains unclear and shrouded in mystery. Thank you.